Foundation, and welcome to Songwriters, The Next Generation, a program of the ASCAP Foundation and the John F. Kennedy Center, which tonight and tomorrow night will showcase the work of emerging songwriters and composers from representing the worlds of rock, soul, jazz, concert music, and pop, performing for you tonight on the beautiful Millennium Stage. Songwriters, The Next Generation was conceived by the late Dr. Billy Taylor, the great jazz pianist, composer, and educator. He was an ASCAP Foundation board member and the Kennedy Center's artistic director for jazz. With us to introduce our music creator artists and to engage them in a discussion following their performance, he's an ASCAP singer-songwriter who hosts NPR's syndicated public radio concert program, Mountain Stage, which I'm sure you're familiar with. He's also a prolific children's music recording artist, and in the 1970s, he enjoyed a top 10 hit with his witty novelty song, Junk Food Junkie. Please welcome Larry Gross. Thanks very much. Thank you, Colleen, and thanks to ASCAP for having me back. I was here last year. This is a great program they have to showcase some wonderful talent. It gives them a chance, and it uh, gives us a chance to hear some, some new folks. If you don't know what ASCAP is, if you're watching right now on the web, on the webcast, the live webcast, and Google ASCAP. It's a very important organization for composers, publishers, and songwriters. You're going to hear all kinds of things that you could call songs tonight. Uh, different flavors, as Colleen has just said, tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, tonight we have two, and tomorrow two more. A little bit later on, Mr. Aaron Lee Tastian is going to be out. But we're going to start with a young woman who is from Puerto Rico originally, now lives in New York City. And she is a composer, and she's a musician. She's going to be playing the accordion tonight and sing. And she composes pieces, uh, sometimes with vocals, that uh, use a lot of different kind of acoustic instruments as well as electronics and toys and pretty much anything she can imagine is involved. She has a dream team tonight that uh, she's brought down from New York City to be with her, dif different uh, folks playing along. Her music has been performed by a lot of different groups over the years, Janus Trio, Cadillac Moon Ensemble, the NYU Symphony Orchestra, Puerto Rico Symphony Orchestra, uh, and she has two groups. She started off with a group called Balloon, an electronic group, and then uh, she went into another one called Arturo and El Barco, both of which have released uh, CDs. She has a master's in music from NYU, and she's working on her uh, doctorate right now. She also works with, with children, with very young children, which I think is great. Somebody this talented has a uh, Spanish immersion music program called uh, Aco Pladitos. Please welcome right now to the Millennium Stage, songwriters, the next generation, Angelica Negron. We're going to be playing three songs for you tonight, three new songs. The first one is called El Relo, which means the clock.
is called Cosmovision.
Our last song is called Aquario. And it's about swimming above water.
Thank you. Thanks so much. As Larry said, this is my dream team ensemble. Here we have Jose Olivares and Live Electronics. <laughs> Shayna Dunkelman and the Silo Synth. <laughs> Jackie Carrot and the Harp. And Johnny Rogers and Glasses. Thanks again for listening. The composer, singer, accordion player, and also playing several other instruments, Angelica Negron. <laughs> that is, uh, that, that's, that's wonderful stuff. It weaves a spell that you're happy to go under. I love that kind of music right there. That if, there is, if I can say that kind of music, it seems to be one of a kind. But... Uh, it was also nice to hear the 
glass harp back there. You don't hear that every day. In West Virginia, I come from West Virginia. We do that, but we use mason jars. <laughs> Actually, funny enough, uh, you may not know this, but the last time I heard a, a glass harp playing, and I was talking to Johnny about this, West Virginia uh, Symphony has a string quartet. My wife was in it, and they performed Black Angels by George Crumb. And uh, George Crumb is from West Virginia, if you didn't know that. Just inducted into the West Virginia Music Hall of Fame. Angelica Negron, originally from Puerto Rico, now living in New York. And she didn't mention that Jose back there on the electronics is also her husband. So they collaborate <laughs> all the time. Well, this is Songwriters, the Next Generation, on the Millennium Stage here in the Kennedy Center. And it's produced by the ASCAP Foundation. Uh, Dr. Billy Taylor set this up, had the idea a good while ago. And tonight and tomorrow night, there'll be different flavors of songwriters from different parts of the world. The next one originally is from Ohio, uh, not far from Columbus. And he actually has a lot of experience in uh, music and songwriting and singing and playing the guitar, even though he's a young guy because he started very young. In his mid-teens, he not only did a show with Peter Yarrow in Cincinnati, and he just told me the story of that. It was kind of interesting. He had written a song for a special event, and Peter Yarrow was there, and they became friends. But then he went on when he was uh, 16 and became outstanding guitarist. He, he won the Outstanding Guitarist Award at the essentially Ellington competition at Lincoln Center in New York City, which is a jazz award, of course. So obviously, you know, he's got tremendous chops on the guitar. But he plays pop, he plays rock, he plays jazz, obviously, and he's going to play acoustic tonight. And he went on right after high school to New York City, got a, got a record deal with Razor and Tide, and the record was uh, produced by Tony Visconti, the great uh, producer. Then he got a job singing with the New York Dolls for a while while he was doing another group called the Madison Square Gardeners. And then he joined forces with uh, B.P. Fallon. And uh, he wrote, they wrote a song called, I Believe in Elvis Presley, which was produced by Jack White and put out on Mr. White's label, Third Man Records. And then later, Fallon and uh, Mr. Tastian here continued their partnership with another group called Operation Juliet, along with Sean Lennon in that group. He's got a song out there now called Apathy Junkie that is on uh, in the Steve Carroll film The Way, Way Back. And he reminded me, and I, I must admit, I didn't, I didn't remember his name, but he was on Mountain Stage just about a year ago, but he wasn't the, I would have remembered if he was the solo performer, but he was accompanying Rosie Golan. So I, all I remember was she had a good guitar player. <laughs> and now he's stepping out front, and you're going to hear his tunes. Please welcome to the Millennium Stage, Songwriters of the Next Generation, Mr. Aaron Lee Tastian. All right, all right. Thanks so much for having me. My name's Aaron Lee Tastian. If you've never seen me sing before, you're gonna. Uh, this is a song that uh, I made up called American Tan, and it goes like this. <laughs> the white people problems in the world, son. The white people might be the biggest one. It ain't a race thing. I don't believe in that. But you gotta dig deep to get where I'm at. You got so many guns, you could start a war. I thought that's what you had Jesus for. Put a gun in every school, you said that. Let's put the teachers in the gun stores, I said that. Got an American tan. Got an American tan. I'm famous for nothing. I'm rolling in dough. Reality ain't nothing but a TV show. That's right.
Sometimes I think I'd like to steal the Hollywood sign Take all the letters and spell out something else Maybe try something like a too rich to die Or just change every letter into a dollar sign The more truth you tell, the more expensive the words The next voice of a generation's gonna need the money to get heard well, that easy money is gone from me, is it too tough? Cause there's way too much of it and it's still never enough. Got an American tan. Got an American tan. I'm famous for nothing. I'm rolling in dough. Reality ain't nothing but a TV show. That's right. It's the way that it feels. Nobody's making music, they're just all making deals. I'll make a deal with you right now. It's a real game changer, are you ready? Let's roll on and put on the stones. Come on now. Got an American tan. Got an American tan. Well, I'm famous for nothing. I'm rolling in. Well, thank you so much. All right. <laughs> I like to do a song. Uh, I like to do a song for you now that I made up with my friend Curtis. Uh, my friend Curtis is from a little town in Missouri called Mexico, Missouri. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Mexico, Missouri or not, but one person, there we go, see? She knows what I'm talking about. It's kind of like one of those places where you walk into the bar and you want to buy the place around the teeth, but uh, it's, a cool, it's a cool little town, Mexico, Missouri. And uh, so my friend Curtis is a filmmaker and a photographer, and uh, he came up with the title for this song. He said, man, you gotta write this song and I'll make a movie about it. And I said, okay, cool. So we made up this, this film that we're working on, but the name of the song and the movie is A Thousand Miles of Bad Road, and it goes like this. I run into trouble like people run into their best friend. I know it like the back of my hand. I know I'll probably see it again. Time ticks away from that clock on the wall. Like a wrist wears a watch, I will wear the fall. So many secrets with so many lies. So many tears and so many eyes. None of them things gonna get you a ride on a thousand miles of bad road. You bet your life, you bet your shoes It's as easy to win as it is to lose Walking with Jesus and the devil too On a thousand miles of bad road Well some folks think There's a tongue in my cheek Honey, I'm just telling the truth I say what I mean Sharp like a razor or Billy Joe Shavers bullet pointed at me scarred but smarter and getting hit harder than I ever thought I'd be so many secrets so many lies so many tears and so many eyes none of them things gonna get you a ride on a thousand miles of bad road you bet your life you bet your shoes it's 
It's easy to win as it is to lose. Walking with Jesus and the devil too. On a thousand miles of bad road. There's a change come over me. I'm not the one I used to be. Now people fall apart like grains of sand. I try to love them the best I can. So many secrets, so many lies, so many tears, and so many eyes. None of them things gonna get you a ride on a thousand miles of bad road. You bet your life, you bet your shoes, it's as easy to win as it is to lose. Walking with Jesus and the devil too, on a thousand miles of bad road. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to, uh, there's a song that I made up uh, a couple of years ago on this uh, record I did called Hard Love and Free Love. And uh, this guy from down in Fort Worth, Texas named Pat Green recorded it for his last record. Uh, and it ended up on number 15 on the U.S. Billboard country charts with the bullet. <laughs> It's called The Streets of Galilee, and uh, it goes like this. Salvation Army band and followed them across the land. We cried for crowded streets full of garbage men. Seemed to save us with their gallant trucks that shine just like the first time we fell in love, but it'll never feel the way it was when we were kids again. So they sang, we wore the lights of the moon and strikes your heart with a silver spoon. An extermination plan from June is the music of your favorite tune. This country's dead, Maria. Come on, let's go dancing tonight. But if you want to feel the Holy Ghost, then join the band and burn your clothes. Because the last great hope of rock and roll ain't some Barbie doll on a stripper pole. And I know every word to your first CD. And I would marry you tonight on them streets of Galilee. So desperately you kiss my face like you're from another time or place A memory I cannot seem to trace at all But triumphant you pull back into town like a circus and what a juggling clown A fighter for a critically acclaimed artist who can't even draw So light one up for me and say I'll save you from another day of petty lies And gutless folks who steal from you to give you hope I get the feeling nowadays there ain't nothing left to save. So let's load the cannons to fire so far with we'll outer space from inside my car. Cause we all used to dream so hard, but nowadays we're all too sick and tired. I cried so much, my dear, the tears are like a sea. There's a ship we can ride across on them streets of Galilee. so long to get blowed up but maybe when we finally go MTV will show some videos 
and apologize for all their shows, in which they tried a little harder to find something cool. I mean, come on, man. Would it kill you to play a little junk food junkie every now and again? <laughs> I guess I don't really watch TV, but I know I would if I could see a beat poet laughing at misery, just like it's 1963. And baby, you gotta know, I loved you even way back then. Oh, so on you take my hand and have a beer on Milwaukee's Avenue. Hell of a year, and I promise to hold you up, my love. You can see the singer take his drugs. I have Since 1993. That was the year of Kurt Cobain. Snap bracelets. All the cool stuff. So I, you guys got like 10 minutes or something? Can I tell you a story real quick? I grew up in a small town in Ohio and uh, I was started, I was playing guitar, you know, I was playing acoustic guitar just like this. And, my hero was this guy named Tim Easton from there in town, and uh, he was a real great kind of country blues singer, and I really liked him, and he was playing acoustic guitar just like I am, you know, and, uh, and so I was, I, was, uh, I, was, I was hanging out one day, and, then I, and I found somebody told me there was this whole other kind of guitar called the electric guitar that you could play. And if you did that, like, you know, chicks would take their shirts off and, you know, the money gets higher, you know, all kinds of cool stuff happens. And, uh, and so I thought, man, I got to figure out how to play one of those things, you know, and I'm what they call a visual learner where I kind of, I look at things and I can see them and then I can do them afterwards. So I started looking through the paper of who I could go see play guitar. And in Ohio, we got this thing called the Ohio State Fair. I don't know if you guys got a state fair here or not, but let me tell you a little bit about what that's about real quick. A state fair is like basically a whole mess of tents with a bunch of people and they're all walking around and you can see like who's got the biggest pig or who carved the best statue of Garth Brooks out of butter, different stuff like that, you know. And uh, so I had this, went down to the state fair because I saw this advertisement in the newspaper for this guy playing there called the Motor City Madman. His name was Ted Nugent. And, uh, I saw his picture, man, and he had on like a headband and a loincloth, and I thought, this cat knows what he's doing, and I ought to kind of dig this guy, you know. And so I went down there, <laughs> I went down there to the, to the gig, and, and he did all the hits, man. He did Cat Scratch Fever, he did everything, it was really great. And, uh, and then he finished his set, and he came on for the encore, and he did this, <laughs> this really weird song called Asshole which is basically where that guy would sing about different people that he thought were assholes, and then one by one, his road crew would bring out a life-size cardboard cutout of each individual he sang about, and he would shoot him through the heart with a flaming crossbow live on stage. People wonder why that dude says weird stuff on the TV. All you gotta do is go to the show to figure it out, you know what I'm saying? But my point in telling this to you tonight, my brothers and sisters, is, uh, you know, uh, Sometimes I feel like I missed out on all the good revolutions and it seems like maybe we could use one right about now and uh, I'm not talking about the kind of revolution where you need a parade and a bunch of people smashing things up and burning them down like old Uncle Ted. I'm talking about the kind of revolution you can start in your own bedroom with a couple rock and roll posters on your wall and a six pack of Mickey's Big Mouth. That's the way we used to do it back in the day. I was out with some friends the other night. We were all sitting around uh, at dinner, and no one was talking, man. It was weird. Everybody was just sitting there on their phones, text messaging each other. I felt left out. I got up, went next door to the pawn shop, bought a typewriter, wrote them all a letter. Dear friends, if you're going to check out Ted Nugent, stick to the early stuff. On them streets of Galilee.
you today as living proof that one good hat, a fuzz guitar pedal, and a sorted pass would go a long way to keep you in free beer and good company in this man's America. Thank you so much for giving me a chance to sing for you tonight. Take care of each other. Aaron Lee Tastian right there. Mr. Aaron Lee Tastian. Originally from Ohio, now lives up in New York City. I don't think it's going to be hard to get him to talk during an interview. <laughs> He's uh, already seen a lot of success, both as a guitar player and as a songwriter. You just heard Pat Green. You may know Pat, a uh, great Texas country artist, and uh, took that song to number 15 that you heard. And he's had a lot of other success, uh, both in groups and uh, playing guitar for folks. We're going to take a moment and get the folks back out here and, and say a word or two to them so you get to know them a little bit better. You've heard them now, and now it's time to hear what they might have to say. If you just joined us, this is Songwriters, the next generation produced by the ASCAP Foundation here on the Millennium Stage at the Kennedy Center if you're watching on the webcast. So let's see if we can get Angelica Negron out and Aaron. And we'll just have a little quick talk. Are we on again? Yeah. They're on top of it. Good job, both of you. A lot of, a lot of fun, very interesting. Two, two, certainly two different styles of music right there to say the least. Let me start off with uh, Angelica. I want to read a quote about your music. It was online radio station Q2 said that your music is suffused with a kind of compassion as if regarding something very small and delicate but without condescension. They said you sample tiny noises, seemingly trivial sounds, and you turn them into music. I think we heard that during the pieces that you did. What do you think about that? Do you agree with that? Yeah, in a very little way, actually. I love to sample tiny noises. Uh, I, I love toys, as you all saw. Um, music boxes are something that I collect and use a lot, but I'm not only interested in the beautiful sound in music box uh, melodies, but also in the clicking sound that happens when you are cranking the music box. So those things are always in the live electronics and, and also the noise, the mic, made when I was recording the music box. So those tiny little things are what, what I put in, into my music. So that they're literally tiny. And then I also use a lot of micro samples, which are like really, really like one second samples of my previous pieces. So maybe like in some of the pieces that I played for you today, there was a tiny one second sample of an orchestra piece or something like that. So and I just dirty them up and always add a lot of noise. <laughs> Did you start as a very young girl being interested in this sounds like that? I grew up as a violinist, actually. Uh, I played piano. I started to play piano when I was eight, and then a little after I started to play violin. And I was growing up in San Juan in a very traditional conservatory environment, so I didn't even know that you could write new music. That was something that was completely um, just foreign to me. I just played... Uh, Mozart, Beethoven, and then if I was lucky, Debussy. So it was all very, very, very um, <coughs> old music. And I didn't know that there were people that were alive that were writing music. So when I found that out, then that was a big revelation to me. And then I just been writing music ever since. Listening to your music and thinking about, you know, stereotypical Latin music, which obviously very upbeat, yeah. a lot of percussion, a lot of big exactly brassy like sound. Mine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did, would, did that influence you at all, or was it something you just didn't like, or you, or you dug it but didn't so, go that direction? To be really honest with you, I think it influenced in the way that I wanted to escape from it. Uh, I, grew up in, I grew up in Carolina, which is uh, where reggaeton was born. So I was trying to compose, and it was like blasting. Boom, 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 boom. So it's not really good, my reggaeton rhythm. <laughs> but you I'm went the other direction. Not. You decided. But it, it just was something that was just very abrasive and just always there. It's, it's, it's something that I, in a way, wanted to escape from. And so writing music for me was a way of escaping from that. It's different now that I live in New York City. I've been six years there. So when you move somewhere, then you all immediately want to be closer to the places you're not. So, so then I feel, I feel that not 
in this type of music, but some concert pieces that I've written, uh, especially one piece I wrote for the group Cadillac Moon Ensemble, it's called Kimbombo, and it's, it has a lot of Latin elements. It just comes out in some ways, but it's, it's just now I want to be closer to San Juan, and, it, and music brings me closer to those spaces yeah. when I can't fly there. Nothing so. makes you miss a place like leaving it. You come, yeah. I mean, looking back, you really get, understand why, why there's something there. Did, did you, when you were studying Beethoven and, and even Debussy, did you, uh, did you do any modern, studying modern composers? I mentioned no, George no, no. Crumb after you left. Did, yeah, any, anything I love like George that? Crumb. George Crumb was one of the first living composers I heard, actually. Um, I started re writing music for bands. Uh, I was in a band that was a string quintet and, mm -hmm. and sampler and electronics and a, and a singer. And then... The viola player from that group was a composer, so I he told me like you're writing all this music for this band. Why aren't you not? Why aren't? And I know you don't really like to be in the violin department. Why are not you're not in the composition department? And I'm like, oh, there is such a thing. Uh, <laughs> and so I was almost done with my bachelor's and with my undergrad uh, degree in, in violin, and then uh, switch to composition. But yeah, it's it's nothing. Not, there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of great, actually, living composers there, but that are not played often. Yeah. So uh, we're working on it. They're working on it, too. Um, and yeah, well, you actually may shine a light on some of those folks because you, you're kind of bridging the gap uh, mm -hmm. between a pop thing and, uh, and classical in yeah. some ways. And there are a lot of groups that are, are doing that. Not a whole lot, but there yeah. are some that are doing it now, which Definitely. makes it's a very interesting thing. Is your, is your doctorate in composition, uh, what, what's the doctorate you're working on? Yeah, composition. All right. Yeah. It, is it important that to you that you get the degree? Uh, yes, it is. Mom, you're watching, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is very important. Trying to yeah. give her a chance. To I ha I'm in that weird space that I finished my coursework and I'm all done with classes and I'm just yeah. like learning German or trying to learn German so I can get ahead of yeah, writing my I didn't want to bring up a sore pieces. subject there. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> no, no, no. I am, I, it's really important to me. Yeah, and studying with Tanya, Tanya Leon, which, is, which was my teacher uh, at the grad center, was amazing. Uh, so I'm just... I, it's hard sometimes to find time to write music, which is my m main interest. So, yeah, of course. so yeah, but uh, yeah, it's oh, really important. You play, important you to perform, me. you're writing, you're trying to get a degree. Yeah, yes, there's a yeah lot and of I'm things teaching a lot on. too, so it, it's Doing a little difficult sometimes to manage to find yeah. the time, but it's it's definitely a top priority. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me turn to Aaron here, a man uh, who's never at a loss for words, we've seen. Uh, well, you, you did start out playing the guitar, and it's interesting what you said about the acoustic guitar. Tim Easton is a friend of ours. He was just on Mountain Stage in Alaska about uh, six months ago when we were up there. He's a great singer and songwriter. It's funny that I didn't know you were connected with him. Uh, but did you, is that, was that true? You started out on the acoustic guitar and then thought, wait a minute, I'm going to go another direction. Yeah, yeah. Well, I used to go, uh, I, had, I had some friends in, in, uh, in Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio, that uh, owned this bar. Uh, where Tim Easton used to play, and, and even though I was really young, they knew that that's kind of what I was into, so they would let me sort of sneak in and watch him. Uh, and, and Tim was one of my, one of my guys early on, um, uh, which was where the sort of the more of the folk stuff that I was doing came from. Um, but I, I, yeah, it, I, was, I was hanging, I started hanging out with all these older guys, you know, um, and uh, they, were, they were all in their 20s, you know, and they were all listening to, to Led Zeppelin, and, ancient. Well, yeah, because I, you know, I was like, well, you, what, you, 15 you, this or one something. You were, yeah, 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 and uh, and they were all into Led Zeppelin and the Stones, and you know, and uh, and a lot of those kind of bands, and and so they kind of they kind of turned me on to to a lot of that stuff too, and I got a lot of music from my parents too. Actually, my my dad used to play a lot of like Count Basie orchestra and stuff like that, and West Montgomery, which was where I kind of heard all of the jazz that I heard for the first time. And then my mom was more into the to the folks and rock stuff, you know, Dylan and 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 the Stones and stuff too. So, um, but yeah, that that was the, the, the those were the kind of the catalyst that really that really got me into uh, into making music. And and then I sort of you know with what I've been doing more recently with the the guitar playing and the solo show, I was kind of trying to find a way to kind of combine those two things together, if you could, and kind of have a, a show that was m more like a folk show, but also had elements of some of the, m you know, louder rock and roll bands that I was into. 
Yeah, and you did several things with that, that were loud rock and roll. Must have been interesting to work with Tony Visconti if you were into the classic rock, because he produced David Boy, a lot of yeah. other things. Yeah. Must have been a, a real trip. How did how did that come about? Well, Tony, we had this we had this uh, we had this manager who I who I ended up in a band with <laughs> later on. But yeah, his name was B.P. Fallon, and he's like a he's like a famous DJ in Ireland. You know, he he has a radio show and. And um, he was he was like the opening act for U2 as a DJ on the Zoo TV tour. Um, but so BP was very well connected in the world of rock and roll. You know, he used to work at Apple Records. He was he was Mark Boland's press guy. He coined the term T Rex to see. Uh, and there's a T there's actually a Mark Boland lyric where he refers to purple browed beep, which is uh, a reference to BP as well. Uh, but BP, um, he he knew Tony from working with all those guys, you know, and he brought Tony down to a show, and and uh, and Tony said yes, <laughs> by the grace of uh, somebody, yeah. and uh, and it was really uh, man, it was such a treat to to get to work with him, certainly on a musical level, but it was really great for the stories. <laughs> it was oh. really great to hear him talk about David Bowie, like painting his apartment in 1968, you know. I bet, yeah. Did is this? Um it just what you're doing now is this the direction you want to be going full speed now? Or are you still playing in bands too while you're doing this? Yeah, I, I this this is pretty much all I do now. I still very occasionally um, do tours as a guitar player. I'm going out actually um, on a three guitar player tour. Uh, it's me, Sylvain Sylvain from the New York Dolls, and Glenn Matlock from the Sex Pistols in April. Um, but uh, for the most part, this is this is it, and I, I love it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's my favorite. Every morning I get up, I'm excited to work on it. So, so it's almost really like, even though you're a young guy, it's kind of full circle because you started out the acoustic guitar in your hand. And tell tell him what you told me, how you got he got he got to know uh, Peter Yarrow, who's still a friend of yours, I guess, and uh, yeah. acquaintance, and you got to know him when you were what. A, Mid-teen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I was. I think I was 15 or 16. I had my high school principal was really into music. He was really cool. He actually he went to a schools conference one time in Chicago and brought a brought me back a Buddy Guy T-shirt. <laughs> um, and then my dad took me to see Buddy Guy. So that that was. Why can all principals be that? I right? know, right, man? No, this guy was really cool. Scott Stewart. He was kind of like Bill Clinton. Uh, he was always like jingling change in his pocket, and he kind of had a lean and a really great <laughs> accent. But uh, he. Um, yeah, he, 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 we had a, a program at school um, to sort of, as a remembrance for the Columbine thing uh, called Promote the Peace Week, and we had a special assembly, and he asked me if I wanted to write a song, uh, which I'd been doing, but not really that seriously. It was just sort of something I was doing for fun in my basement, um, and I thought, well, let me you know, see what I can come up with, and so I wrote this song, and, uh, and he really dug it, and he ended up telling this guy... Uh, who was doing a, another school's conference down in Cincinnati about it. And he said, well, we got Peter Yarrow coming to our thing, so why don't you bring Aaron down here and he can open for Peter. And, uh, and I played that song and, and Peter dug it. And, uh, and, you know, the next thing, you know, we were hanging out and singing Puff the Magic Dragon, whatever else you want to do with Peter, Peter Yarrow. If you don't know who Peter Yarrow is, it's Peter, Paul, and Mary. Peter Yarrow, he still performs, of course. As a matter of fact, he's going to be in Charleston in a couple of months doing a show there. He's still... He's still out performing. Great guy. Well, let's see. Well, we still have a few more minutes here. So let me ask you guys, uh, first go back to Angelica if we can. What's next? What are you, what are you working on now? You, are, you, are you recording? Are you, are you getting on, going on tour? What's the deal? I am recording with my band Balloon, and I'm also working on an opera for puppets, and my ensemble Arturo en el Barco. So it's hopefully this year at the end, in November, uh, we'll get to premiere that. What, so what's what's the puppet company? Is there? Is this it's a puppet company from Puerto Rico, which I've worked uh, extensively with. It's called Inovia Luz, which translates to "and there was no light." So mm -hmm. Inovia Luz, and they do wonderful work with puppets and masks, and their plays are often uh, silent, so um, so there's no dialogue. And I've I've been writing music for them for like almost 11 years. And so this is a big project that we're taking on uh, this year. It's a, an, a short opera, like 45 minute work. The puppet's and gonna sing, or who's, who's it's, if it's an opera, it's uh, gotta have yeah. vocals. Yes, it's four to five singers working on it right now, and it's, uh, actually I'm right now in the stage of like developing my, my own 
uh, alphabet and language kind of for, for the opera because I've been struggling a lot with, um, I, I can't imagine myself singing in English because it's not my native language. So all, all the songs you heard today were in Spanish and that's how uh, in Balloon I also sing in Spanish. Um, so for the opera, uh, we're kind of trying to create this immersive world of its own and, and coming up with this new language that hopefully creates meaning as the opera develops and, and you'll understand it while it's happening. Cool. And Aaron, what's you, you recording? Uh, yeah, I am actually. I just put out a record uh, not too long ago called The Thinking Man's Filth um, that I got for the title from this, this great guy uh, from Manchester named John Cooper Clark who kind of looks like Ron Wood but talks like Keith Richards. Um, and he's a, he's a poet, you know, he used to open for like Joy Division in the 70s and stuff like that. He's like a like a post-beat kind of um, punk rock poet, really. Uh, and we were watching that show Family Guy in Ireland together, and he just turned to me and said, you know, man, this show is filth, but it's like the thinking man's filth, you know? <laughs> and I thought, that's a great title. I'm stealing that one. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm work so I, pu I put that out, and I've been torn on that. I'll be torn on that for a little while. And at the same time, I'm, I'm working on a, a new record right now. Um, uh, and uh, and a movie with my friend Curtis called A Thousand Miles of Bad Road. The one, the song you sang here. Yes, sir. And you really are making a movie. We, we sure are. You weren't just no, joking. No, we're making a movie. So are you recording in New York? Yep, yeah, yeah, I'm recording in but New is York. This, is this solo? Are you doing a band with it or what? It's, uh, it's, 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 it's kind of like, it's kind of like what you saw, uh, here, uh, only a little more fleshed out and textured. I was really inspired by that, uh, Lenoise record that Neil Young put out with Danny Lanois producing and yeah. really interesting guitar sound. So the guitar, the guitar sound on it is going to be very, um, sort of, uh, full and interesting and maybe a little bit of a different sound from what most people are used to hearing in Americana music, I think. But, uh, but I think it's, it's, gonna, it's coming out pretty fun so far, so yeah. I'm excited about it. Yeah, Lanois does a lot. I mean, he, he actually changed Americana music in, oh, yeah. in, a, in a nice way with the Emmy Lou and, and, and the Dylan stuff and yeah. even Willie Nelson. Is yeah. When you can do a lot of things without a lot of instruments. That's true, If man. you get the sounds out of the ones that you're using. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank both of you guys for being with us. And thanks to ASCAP, the ASCAP Foundation. This is Songwriters, the next generation, and we will be back here tomorrow evening at the same time. So if you're watching on the web, you can uh, hear two more very talented young folks that are part of the ASCAP organization. Our thanks to everybody here at the Kennedy Center. Thanks to folks at the Millennium Stage. Goodbye. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Buenas noches.